After coming off season 14, which had a whole lot to do with a lot of things, but nothing really to do with our main story, fans seemed to be fine with it, even though it wasn't exactly what they were looking for in terms of a season. Fans didn't really seem to dislike it, however, after an ending like season 13's, they were understandably not looking for what could be considered a filler season. So with season 15, we were back to the main narrative, but is it good? Joe Nicolosi was the head writer and director for the season. Before this, he had only worked on a few Red vs. Blue episodes prior, such as in Season 14, The Brick Gulch Chronicles. So because Bernie is tired of writing the story and Miles is writing about five other shows, it fell upon Joe to handle this season. For better or for worse, this story takes place about 10 months after the events of Season 13. The plot revolves around the Reds and Blues going on a supposed killing spree, while newcomer to the series Dylan Andrews investigates what really is happening, and events unfold from there, as you guys have already hopefully watched it. So let's address this first. I see a lot of comments saying that they wanted to see the fight or whatever happened after the events of Season 13. Oh, I wanted to see Tucker Swish Swish stabbing his sword, Sarge blasting people with his shotgun, all this other stuff. And when I see comments like that, it's like, well, you kind of answered why you're not going to see what happened. This is a moment that your imagination is probably more than likely better than what you actually would have gotten. So for the people who want to see our heroes fight out of that room, it was best left up to your imagination. Anyway, back to season 15. Let's start with the characters. Dylan Andrews, the reporter. From what appeared at the first few episodes, I was under the impression that she was going to be our main character for the season. They set up this mystery, as it were, to hunt the truth, made people question whether or not something really did happen to the Reds and Blues, and Dylan was kind of the audience's perspective put into a character. She questioned things, learned about their stories, and used logic to drive her closer and closer to the truth. Part of the reason I thought she would be the main focus is that they set up more to her character. If she was someone who was just going through everything the Reds and Blues had done, it would have felt like a character giving you a recap on all the events, which I would say most fans don't need. However, with Dylan, they set up more to her, specifically when it came to her husband. She seemed to become more than just a reporter with a name. It felt like they were going to pursue and tell a story about her. So, with this idea that I technically planted into my own mind, I became excited to learn more about someone who wasn't like the Reds and Blues, as opposed to the chorus group, because they really did burn me out in terms of their personalities. And even though I was super excited to learn more about Dylan, we really didn't, and I'm sad about that. She very quickly went from what seemed like a main character of the season, to a background character who spoke every few episodes, if that. And same kind of sort of thing goes for her partner, Jax Jones. While I didn't enjoy Jax as much, he seemed to be a character who was introduced for the sake of introduction. He was telling you what was going on, he was narrating it as if it were a story. It was a shtick that was alright, up until it got kind of old and intrusive in my opinion. There were just a few moments with his character that seemed to break any tension or took away from a moment that was happening, all for a quick joke. Now don't get me wrong, I think there were a lot of moments with his jokes or references that were fine and didn't negatively affect what was happening. But when it does pull you out of a moment, it's a lot more noticeable. Take for example Vic's death. This was a moment I feel as though pulled the audience away from the moment a bit. The fact that Jack said that they needed a sacrifice because that's what happens in movies, it's a cliche and now we have to do that cliche. It takes, at least me, out of the moment slightly because when I'm watching I'm thinking, oh what's gonna happen, is the world gonna be destroyed, are they gonna time travel, what's gonna happen? And then Jax comes in with some dialogue that I don't find necessary. They already established that Vic wanted to die, the drill was clearly a computer of some sort, the audience could have put two and two together if Vic was just like, I got this dude, let me take care of it, and then sacrificed himself. Jax's dialogue seemed more like a, Jax hasn't said anything in a while, let's have him call out the cliche. Now this is not to say that I dislike Jax, he's not exactly my favorite character, but he's not my least favorite either. I thought he and Dylan mixed pretty well together, granted that's the duo as old as time, the funny man and the straight man, but still. So I think Dylan and Jax, mainly Dylan, were two characters who had a lot of potential for the season, but were ultimately pushed aside once the Reds and Blues came back into the picture. Speaking of the Reds and Blues, what really is there to say about them? We've only been following them for 15 years. So let's focus on the biggest developments with those who had them. Tucker, the simplest of developments. Tucker from the beginning appeared pretty normal. He didn't seem to have changed that much, until Church came back into the picture. His fun demeanor, as it were, was then pushed aside and then he became Church. He took the lead and complained and bitched at people a lot. Which is not a negative statement, those are just Church's traits. And now that Church is finally gone, Tucker more and more seems to be slipping into that position. That's really all I have to say about him. 
Caboose. His development was a lot more extreme. The entire season, once the Reds and Blues were reintroduced, had this small spotlight on Caboose and his understanding of death, or lack thereof. We already know how childish of a mind Caboose has, and so many of his interactions with characters, one way or another, wound up around the topic of death. Simmons was explaining how even though Church keeps on coming back, that's not how death is supposed to happen. He was a rare case. Tucker and Temple saying that Church really is gone. So it was an ongoing development this season with Caboose. And in the end, he does grasp it, in a way. He came face to face with Alpha and Blood Gulch and made no attempt to save him. He instead moved on and accepted his death. However, and I've expressed this before, while it was some pretty big development for Caboose, I feel as though it could have been so much more if he had never saw Church again. Because part of death is that they're gone. We've seen so many other examples of characters who have died and didn't get any kind of closure that they wanted. An example would be Carolina and York. Carolina didn't get to say her goodbye to him. It was just one day he died and all there were were old recordings. She had to accept that, but Caboose, instead of going through the tougher road and accepting his loss, he still got to see Church again and turned down the offer, which seems honestly like such an easier option. However, Caboose did end up really developing as a character, even though it was a bit of a fairy tale ending. Griff. The most unexpected of developments. We know that he's lazy, doesn't want to do anything, and like most of the Reds and Blues, doesn't exactly like everyone. When the possibility of Church returning came back up, Griff wanted nothing to do with it. He's dead, stop trying. But as the season progressed, we saw as his lack of human interaction drove him a little crazy. All the antics that he's gotten used to over the years has kind of become the normal at this point. So his development came from the fact that he does see all of them as his friends and needs them. At least for his sanity. So he's come to appreciate everyone more, I guess. I will say if there's one thing that I really liked about Griff's whole mini arc is that not much tends to happen with Red Team. They're usually there for the antics of some other story. And while that still for the most part holds true this season, this has been one of the biggest focuses on a member of Red Team ever. And while I personally still would have loved if Griff had more of a role this season in terms of story relevance, I do appreciate the focus and development that he had this season. Now let's talk about the villains, the Blues and Reds. In the end, I feel as though they ended up doing more harm than good, in a manner of speaking. First, their existence. I wasn't against an evil version of the Reds and Blues. I was actually fairly excited for it. But as we learned more about them, it interfered so much with what we knew. We love the Reds and Blues because of their defined and weird personalities and how their experiences have shaped them. And this season, when we learned that the Reds and Blues aren't the original, that's kind of just a bummer, honestly. They're the copies, they're not the originals, and it's kind of sad to be honest. And I know where the writing was going with it all. The Blues and Reds were the only group of simulation troopers that ended up being forever locked in an endless stalemate. The director saw this and wanted to recreate it to keep the Alpha safe, forever locked in an endless stalemate. I get where it was going, and I can see and appreciate that. However, I think the thing that was the most unfortunate was the personalities and how exact they were. Even with Gene and Simmons being the exact same person practically. It's like, it doesn't matter all the stuff they went through, they're still the exact same people. Temple has bad aim even though Church is an AI and based off the director. Lorenzo is a foreign robot even though robot kits aren't standard issue equipment. And that didn't strike anyone as odd? That you would have a kit to build a robot that looks like a soldier? That's just standard issue equipment, right? What? No! Have you ever run into anyone else who has one? I feel as though it was the carbon copies, as it were, that kind of killed it for me in terms of their existence. I think probably the best of the group was Biff, because he was nothing like Griff. He had his own personality and his own story and was unique enough to make him different. He was still a dumb soldier in the middle of a box canyon, but was unique. However, everyone else was just same old, same old. But what about their story? Essentially, what would have happened if the Reds and Blues went evil, really? Both teams were subject to experimentation to Project Freelancer, just one team went one way and the other the opposite. It was an interesting idea that I think once again towards the tail end of the season ended up falling flat. Because when the trailer was released, everyone had the thoughts, who are these guys going around killing people, how evil? And those thoughts persisted until we came face to face with them. Then they became the friendly, hey, we're not the bad guys, they are. Then they trapped Wash and Carolina and they were back to the super evil psychopathic villains. And finally flopped to a bit of a bitch in the end. It felt like Temple's character specifically was uncertain as to whether or not they wanted him to be a threatening villain or a comedic one. He kept flip-flopping back and forth and I couldn't make him out. And that's one of the biggest problems I had with his character. Now probably one of the biggest criticisms this season got was people said it felt rushed. And here's the thing about that. 
I can't disagree with them. Probably the biggest reason I think it felt rushed was it was only one season. No other season both started and ended a storyline in one season. The Blood Gulch Chronicles took place over five seasons, the recollection at three Project Freelancer was technically five, and the Chorus Trilogy was obviously three. Season 14 had no real narrative. Season 15 was the only season so far that had both started and finished its own complete story. All the other ones had goals and tasks that were accomplished throughout the season, but the big goal was never attained until the arc wrapped. So, to the argument that it felt rushed, I would say relatively speaking, is true. The episodes ranged from 8 minutes minimum to 15 minutes maximum. So, they introduced two main characters, about seven new villains, they had to recap and investigate this newfound mystery, all within 21 episodes. So was it rushed? Well, a lot of events did happen very fast. You can't really argue that relative to the past seasons, this one both started and ended faster than all the others. From the trailer in the first few episodes, I wasn't even sure if we were going to see the Reds and Blues this season. I thought Dylan was going to be the main focus, which perhaps might have been why I really enjoyed the first chunk of the season. Things obviously moved fast, but the episodes that focused on Dylan and her journalism, I found really compelling. The first eight episodes or so I thought were amazing. You had this grand thought of what was really happening with the Reds and Blues. And as each episode went by, questions were answered, but even more were raised. Like, even though Spencer Porkinsonson was a throwaway character, that suspense that he left you with each episode, I thought was handled excellently. It was mainly when everyone came face to face, I think the suspense was broken. It was like, who are these guys going around murdering people and tarnishing the Reds and Blues names? Then they come face to face and it's just, hey, we're the good guys. Even though they weren't, suspense was broken. All this buildup and excitement that was happening inside the viewer vanished and it became more of a waiting game. How long are they going to keep the charade going? So for me at least, it was around episode 8 that this season really slowed down, even though things happened very fast. On the other hand, there were a lot of camera tricks that I think were used very clever that they've never used before. Don't get me wrong, I'm aware they've used the green screen before, even back in season 1, but it was how they used it. Anytime Dylan was interviewing someone, they were always in front of a green screen, which made it feel disconnected from the normal environment, as if an interview were really happening. When Simmons was on the Warthog turret, that was something I thought just made a lot of sense, even though it was something that they hadn't done and didn't need to do, but I think it looked a lot better than just normal all-natural machinima shot. But ultimately, what did I think of this season as a whole? Well, I honestly enjoyed it. It's not without its flaws, don't get me wrong. Certain plot points, like Caboose's closure, the Blues and Reds' carbon copy personalities, it has its flaws definitely, but as a standalone season, I think it holds up well. When people look back at past seasons, they tend to think of the arcs as a whole, when in actuality, the individual seasons are alright, but it's when they come together and form the arc that the storyline that is told becomes amazing. Like, take for example, Season 7. I honestly couldn't tell you off the top of my head what happens only in Season 7. I could tell you what happens through Season 6 through 8, but that's a collection. As an individual and standalone season, I think this holds up well. While it may not be the most vital storyline to these characters, such as with Project Freelancer, it was a storyline that I found interesting. This really was what could have happened to the Reds and Blues if life took them in a different direction of vengeance. It was an interesting concept that perhaps may have benefited more if it stretched out over two or more seasons. However, Joe Nicolosi I think did a great job with his first season. I think he got the tone of the characters we already know down, and he made an interesting story. But I think the biggest reason for why this season ended up suffering the most was time. Would I want Joe to write another season? Absolutely, why not? I really enjoyed this one, and for a first go at an entire season, he did great. So, is Red vs. Blue Season 15 good? Yes, it's definitely not the best and has many flaws, but that's kind of how stories work, and how every season is.